We are in the eighth chapter of the Revelation. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. What happens in this silence depends on the level of your consciousness. The Father is saying, rest a while. Let the truth that you have learned become your flesh. Let my word in you come to the fore. Let my will in you, my power in you, my substance in you be all that you are. And those then who have been sealed in their foreheads, who have received the inner vision, rest now and let the power of the Spirit determine their actions, their will, their thoughts, their deeds. And there will be some too who will say, I have it. I understand everything. And they will discover that their silence is very short, just a half hour, because their mental acceptance did not go deep enough. They are those who have not yet been sealed in the forehead, who have not been open to the capacity to receive the living spirit. Now in this silence, we have a good time to review, to make adjustments, to let the old man die, to let the new be born. And so let's see what we have learned thus far. In the seven letters to the churches, we learn that there is only a spiritual universe in spite of what the eyes tell us. We learn that beyond our five sense perception is reality. And it is perfect. And it is all. And it individualizes as the spiritual individuality of each who walks the earth. And they are perfect. And they function under perfect spiritual law which contains within its perfection the capacity to ever maintain that perfection so that the spiritual universe and those who inhabit it are ever immaculate, always functioning in perfect harmony according to the invaluable principle of the spirit. We learn further that that is all there is, that this is an all-powerful spirit with no opposition there being no other self. We learn it is an all-knowing spirit. We learn it is an ever-present spirit, indivisible from itself. We learn it is infinite. We learn there is nothing in this infinite spirit that is less than infinite. Nothing divided from itself. We learn that perfection is omnipresent and forever lasting. And so the principle is revealed that all is God, all is spirit, ever maintaining itself, ever feeding itself, ever expressing itself, ever self-fulfilling, and that we inhabit that universe and no other. And so for us, the seven seals now represent those barriers in our humanhood which have prevented us from living in and enjoying the perfect universe of God. And as these seals are broken, we find that we started out fairly confident that we had discovered a great truth, but in spite of all our dedication, 
a force unseen, unknown, unrecognized moved through us and it lifted us off the white horse of victory onto another horse and then still another and then still another. We found ourselves riding many horses. We found that in spite of walking in a perfect spiritual universe, we were riding a horse of emotions. We were riding a horse of intellect. We were riding a horse of matter. And all the while we were declaring our fidelity to God. And then came a blessed moment when, through some activity in our consciousness, there was established a communion between the world in which we walked visibly and the invisible universe of God. We discovered that the invisible universe was right here, right where we walked, hidden to our false sense of self. And ultimately, we were sealed in the forehead. We were open to recognize all that we had learned existed through the Christ teaching and then we stood in the kingdom revealed. For some it was a glimpse. For some it never happened. For others it was finally the revelation that where I stand is holy ground. And now in this half hour there is silence in heaven. There is an adjustment period for you and me and every one who has traveled the path to take stock, to let the spiritual awareness deepen so that it may be followed now by acts of the Spirit. We who have then received the inner impulse, the capacity to commune directly with the Father, we who have been turned to Christ within, who is the way, we walk in a sense of the knowledge that here where I stand is the law of God functioning. Here where I stand is the law of the Father operating to express its own perfection. I fear not what mortal man may do to me. I fear no power other than the perfect power of the Father. And of course, we should have reached that state of consciousness which knows, if I be spirit, I am not something else. We may balk at this, and because we do, because we're going to say, Father, I'll accept everything you teach me, but let me have one or two of my illusions, please. There must now sound the trumpets. Those who threw some innate incapacity to open themselves to the absolute find that they are now besieged. Their unwillingness to surrender personal sense personal individuality personal will personal desire their own false sense of physicality all this mitigates, mitigates against that power of spirit within which is saying my will be done and so the friction begins. Matter of fact, it is now intensified. And so there are going to be seven trumpets. And each trumpet is going to be interpreted by the one who shows forth the problem, the pain, the suffering as an act of punishment by the Father. He's going to walk the earth saying, why am I being punished? What have I done to deserve this? I've been good. I've even been holy. I've tried to live a sacred life. What have I done? 
he will not recognize the love of the Father, which is saying, in spite of your unwillingness and momentary incapacity to relinquish your sense of righteousness, your sense of the way the world should be, it is the Spirit's will that you be perfect. And you must be lifted away from your toys. Those cherished toys of adolescence must go. For in spiritual maturity, each of us must walk in the Father's perfect will. Not in the sense that now I know what I am to do, but rather in the sense that now I know that I do not know. Rather do I know that it is the Father's will alone in me activated through the Christ of being that knows the way. I out here do not know and I rejoice in not knowing that it may be revealed through Christ in me what I am to do, where I am to go and how it shall be done. There is finally this surrender, this relinquishing of the last remnant of self. And until this is accomplished, another trumpet must sound. Each trumpet representing another level of love, liberating us from self-will, interpreted by the individual as evil on the earth. And so we will see now how the trumpets are not so much the act of punishment of God as has been told to us but rather a law a law of karma a law such as well let's say you take a recipe book and it says bake the cake for 20 minutes and you put it in the oven and you take it out in 30 minutes You won't say that the author of the book who gave you that recipe is punishing you. You'll simply say you didn't obey the simple instruction of the recipe. And so it is when you violate a divine law, it being perfect, all that is imperfect must now occur. And the imperfections that occur are really the violation of divine law being signaled to you so that you can go back and cease being a prodigal who is violating divine law. And so the cake will burn. And you'll know next time not to put it in for 30 minutes. You'll keep your eyes open. Similarly, when you step off the path of truth, for a while you may seem to prosper but ultimately the cake will burn. And when it does, it is not a punishment of the Father. There is no such thing. It is simply your violation which brings into play the automatic law of karma, of reaping that which you have sown, preventing you from walking out further into additional errors, into blunders that develop into crises. Always our path is held intact by the rod of spirit if we but have ears to hear and eyes to see. And these so-called evils that appear then are evil to some, but when you are seeing them in their true light, they are the law of karma preventing you from straying further. And so now the trumpets. I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now even though evil will seem to appear, these seven trumpets are held by seven angels. We are going to see the law of karma at work. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much 
incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. We have learned in the breaking of the seven seals how to enter into the kingdom of heaven. This was, for John, an actual experience. It was a description of the experience that we are going through. And now those truths we learned are doing something. They are enforcing themselves. It was wonderful to learn the truth. Now we see that truth in spirit is ever active. It blows a trumpet. And every time it blows another trumpet, the truth in you removes, destroys, unearths another remnant of humanhood. And you say, oh, it hurts. It hurts. Yes, it does, but we went in for truth. And truth says, I have not come to bring peace but a sword. I have come to cut away the conditionings of the human mind. And as truth bites in, we feel that incisive bite. We feel the pain of it because we are being released from untruth. Soon we get used to it. We learn that the action of truth is only painful for one reason. We are resisting that truth. When we are moving in a rhythm of our own, unlike the rhythm of the Father, the truth is very unsettling. When we are willing to abide in the truth, to realize that the truth knows better than my human selfhood knows, then we will ride in the rhythm of the truth without friction, without op opposing it. And we will find that the absence of the desire to cling removes the pain. You may not even be conscious of the fact that you are clinging to yesterday when the truth cuts away the false concepts. But every time there's pain, every time there's an inner turmoil, it is because the old is giving way to the new. And we're still trying to cling to the old. To some, this giving way causes a state of terror or panic. To others, it brings a sense of fascination. The adventure of spirit is lifting them beyond the levels of the finite mind. They relax. They know you can't fight the horse in the saddle. They learn to go with the jumps. And it isn't long before you develop the technique of knowing that spirit has a law, a law of progression, a law of many mansions, a law that says today is a new day. Today is a new experience. Today is not like yesterday. Do not store yesterday in the barn. Today is completely fresh, newly minted. Today is fresh manner. Yesterday's concepts must be dropped. You know, if the trees around us were not ever being regenerated, it wouldn't be long before they die. And in our finite human concepts, we think we must ever remain as we are, simply dropping the bad things and accumulating the good things. And spirit says, no, no, if you feel that way, there'll be another trumpet for you. You must learn to let me show you what you cannot know in a finite mind. You too will change just like the tree. Your limbs will give birth to new ideas, and they will give birth to new ideas. You will be my divine image and likeness revealed. You cannot do it in the flesh it profiteth nothing 
to remain in the flesh. And spirit now is saying, as my truth becomes active in your being, a new body is being formed in you, a new way, a new mind, a new life, a complete new you that can continue to live in my kingdom. And this is where we find that we have either been protected by the seal of truth or we are still in that Achilles heel which is vulnerable. You must remember now that we are always given our chance to be sealed against the pains, the sorrows, the false concepts. And if we have been stubborn along the way, spirit now is going to unseat that stubbornness. The only thing in us that is ever going to be destroyed is unreality. Reality of us is omnipotent. Only that which has no truth no substance, that which is not of the Father can be destroyed. The you that is, the spiritual self, the perfect being, is completely immaculate and beyond destruction forever. Only the weeds now are being torn away. We can relinquish them willingly or they are torn away. The first trumpet will soon sound. The angel now that stands at the altar with a golden censer is seen to John in this manner, signifying that the law of truth in you is being enforced. And he sees spirit entering your being as a golden censer. And in this golden censer, this truth, is the incense, the truth that will be poured into your being. To John, this is how it comes. And as this incense is poured from the golden censer, a new age, a new level of consciousness is beginning in you. And as truth enters you, there will be a reaction in you. If you are not sealed, For this truth will be a sword to cut away its opposite. This is an act of love. And this incense is offered with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar before the throne. The smoke now of the incense As spirit, pulsating through your being, new impulses coming to you, you see. You are being open to the impartations of the angels. And as this happens, the smoke of the incense, meaning your deeds, your works, your actions, because of the spiritual impetus now given to you, this smoke, these deeds, rise before the Father. They ascend it up before God out of the angel's hand. Your deeds begin to be of a divine nature. You are released from a degree of self-will. You find a measure of his will taking effect in your consciousness. You are entering the new age of spirit. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar. Divine truth. Cast it unto the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. When this happens in the individual then, the communication of spirit, 
there is an earthquake within that individual there is an overturning now you begin to feel then that when the earthquake in you begins its overturning when you feel the change of consciousness taking place the strangeness it isn't something that is unique in you it is something that everyone goes through when there is a beginning of a change in the life stream from the tree of good and evil to the tree of life as we become open to the power of spirit within those cherished beliefs of yesterday now are being dropped away even against our will the earlier beliefs in sickness in death in the power of the evils of the world these begin to fall away that's all part of our earthquake the power of self will is lessened we're beginning to see the light of how self-will leads to self-destruction and it's described as an earthquake but what is it it's an awakening from a sleep just the first drowsy rumblings of awakening from the dream that evil is possible in the per- creation of god when known for what it is it's a very welcome earthquake because it is going to be the release the change from earth to heaven now this is an assault upon the false material consciousness of the individual and everything that happens which seems to be a great evil is nothing but the breaking up of that consciousness which does not recognize the allness of god for ultimately through these thunderings these lightnings this earthquake there will be the birth of the christ mind the pure consciousness the awareness of the kingdom at hand in all its perfection and now only the mist is being destroyed the glass darkly is being shattered by the invisible action of spirit with its golden censer emptying down to us its incense from the altar of truth the light is coming through and it is a sword to the material consciousness in this you can recognize many of the things that have begun to disturb you which now can be seen from a different attitude and the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound now remember four angels standing at the four corners of the earth have been told to hold back the winds until we have sealed them in their foreheads and now each of the trumpets that sound are being sounded but there's no suffering to those who have been sealed with truth and in this silence in heaven there was an opportunity for us all to return to the father's house to accept the truth 
to abide in the allness of God. And now when the thunderings begin, when the earthquake begins, what is your reaction? Why is there a feeling of torment? Only because we believe that God is not all. That belief must be shaken out of us. What is the torment when you stand in Christ? It is a nothingness. And therefore, in your disbelief in the allness of God, you bake the cake too long or too short. You merely misread the instructions or disobeyed them. We have been learning that God is all. In your acceptance that God is all, you will discover you have already passed the sounding of the trumpets. There are no more trumpets for you. These trumpets are only for those who have not accepted that God is all. Those who have come out of Egypt, those who live in Israel, those who are no longer sense-bound are not hearing these trumpets. They are only the sound of Satan in the midst of us being dislodged from his perch. Satan in the midst being destroyed by the word. God is all. And so the misperceiving individual continues to suffer only because he will not obey the divine law that there is none but I, the Spirit of God. My universe is perfect. My law is perfect. My child is perfect. Be ye perfect. Be ye my child. And the mere acceptance that you are is the rejection of every belief that comes to you that you are not. So we learn to stand there and lo and behold we do not even hear the sound of those trumpets. God is all. That is the song you sing. God is all. In that allness am I. That spirit which is the Father am I. That spiritual law which is perfect, which governs all spirit, is the law that governs my being. And in me that which would deny this that which would acknowledge the power of another law, the power of mortality, the power of disease, the power of pain, that in me which acknowledges these, that is the false consciousness for which these trumpets continue to sound. When that false consciousness dies, I am born to the Spirit. That is the purpose of this inner warfare, to destroy the false consciousness in man, which is called the seat of Satan. We know what it is, of course. It is the world consciousness, the mortal mind, in us, wearing its many disguises, looking out and identifying pain and evil and terror and bad health and lack and limitation and old age where they do not exist. It is mortal mind painting its own pictures and then confirming itself by wearing a disguise calling itself our mind. And through our our eyes it looks at its own false creation confirming it binding us to the untruth. So the angels drop their fire from the altar. The first angel sounded. And there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. 
And they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up. And all the green grass was burnt up. Hail and fire mingled with blood. Oh, but what kind of blood was that? Divine wisdom. What kind of fire? Divine truth. What kind of hail? Divine love. Love, truth, wisdom in the midst of you. That's all. And what was that third part destroyed? The third part of the human will. As this is released in you, that part of the will is destroyed. That you still have self-will. Your will is not taken from you, but now your self-will loses its self-will in the sense that you are willing to will yourself to do the will of God. To bring your will into conformity with the will of God. And so it is said that only a third part is destroyed. No, this isn't torture at all. This is being taught by God. This is surrendering to the divine impulse learning that his voice shall not be mocked. His will in you is being done. And now the second trumpet. The second angel sounded. And as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. The third part of the sea became blood. You know what that sea is? It's man's material consciousness. The sea of world thought. And it becomes blood, a third part. Again, one third of the material consciousness in you becomes divine wisdom, divine blood. And that great mountain burning with fire, which is cast into the sea. is the mountain of desire. The mountain of that desire of the false self which says, I shall glorify me. We've been so used to glorifying the personal self that when it is destroyed in us to a degree, it's like a mountain falling into the sea. What? I cannot go out and do the things I want to do. I cannot build my empires. I cannot show the world how intelligent I am. To lose that seems to be the greatest tragedy in the world. But it's the greatest blessing. For only in the banishment of that great burning desire to be somebody to glorify ourself do we discover the greater joy the permanent joy of glorifying the Father and so the higher intelligence is seeping through the lower and to the lower it's the greatest tragedy in the world everything you have worked for all these years being taken away and yet it's like the t child who yells, Please, Mother, don't take that toy away. It's, it's my dear little baby, that doll. The child doesn't know it must grow up. And the human doesn't know it must grow up. It's self-desires. It's status-seeking. It's great desire to show forth its own intelligence and capacities are its little dolls. It doesn't know that in the wings is waiting a paradise where there are no little dolls to ever take away, where there is no human life to ever be removed, where there is no human form ever to go through a disease or a torture. 
When it gives up its so-called good toys, it also loses all of its bad toys, but it doesn't at that stage know this. It doesn't know it is being redeemed out of the era of centuries, out of false concepts, out of images in time and space. It doesn't know it is being lifted into life eternal on the earth as it is in heaven. And so its loss of the personal sense of self at this particular moment seems like a burning mountain falling into the sea. And now a third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. The creatures in the sea, the sea being material consciousness, the creatures are the concepts of that material consciousness. And so a third part of our material concepts in the sea of human consciousness are destroyed. We learn that God has never sent an earthquake to destroy. God has never sent a hurricane. God is not in the whirlwind. God is not rising up in the sea to swallow ships. God is not causing pestilence upon the earth. We learn our false concepts of matter which have made us prisoners of the mind no longer have power to deceive us. The great deception of mortal mind is slowly taking a new turn in our entire existence. We are beginning to perceive that these things we have attributed to the punishment of God are nothing like that at all. We are learning that there is a force at work, a shadow, a shadow that falls upon the earth from another shadow and that mortal mind passing before the soul casts its shadow into the valley of the shadow of death. You see, the death of our soul is only an imitation death. As soul passes through mortal mind, through the world mind, we are dead to the soul. And that soul passing through world mind casts its shadow upon the earth. It's too bad we have identified that shadow as me, him, and her. But we learn now that we are not that shadow. We are not that image seen through the glass darkly of the world mind. We have only appeared to be. And here we are beginning to see that the evils of the earth and the good of the earth are not divine creation. We are beginning to see that the good which decays and becomes the bad is not divine creation. That the apparent life which is snuffed away, was never a divine life. We are beginning to see that the human image is not the divine image and likeness at all. We are coming out of a deep sleep and it is taking the sound of the trumpets in us to awaken us to reality in all its perfection, ever radiant, ever alive, ever functioning in all its perfection. We are beginning to see that the great, the great deceiver is the world mind. The mist, the glass darkly, which has made us walk through a dream, 
The word dream becomes a very strange word to us. We learn there is no symbolism in the words, Awake thou that sleepest. It is a flat statement of fact. Awake thou that sleepest in unreality. In a dream of mortality. In a dream of matter in a dream of good and evil, in a universe that is not perfect, in a universe of mountains and valleys, of hate and violence. This is the dream. And who is the dreamer? We find the dreamer is the world mind. That world mind which has strayed, never really strayed, can a shadow stray? We find that our soul has been going through its own reflection. Our soul moves through its own reflection and the shadow of that journey is the false sense of self. Divine mind casts its own shadow. The world mind is the shadow. The soul moves through the world mind and then through its own shadow. But when it learns the truth, when we awaken from the sleep, we discover that our soul has never changed. Our soul body has never changed. Our soul life is ever here. And we discover there's a very good use for this human body it's like when we look in the mirror. We see a reflection of ourself. We never say, I am that reflection. It's a reflection of me. It tells me what I look like. I would not know any other way. So too with our soul, it looks into its own reflection. But if we believe the reflection to be us, We walk in this false marriage between the soul and the world mind. We become the child born not of the father, but of the world mind. And we are that mortal mind individualized into form. And all of the sound of the trumpets is occurring in that mortal mind individualized into form, which is the human image unaware that itself, its reality, is the divine image, the perfect child of the Father. The third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. The third part of the ships were destroyed. And these ships are the ideas on which we sail. As we lose some of these ideas, these concepts, we're more willing to release ourselves from the hard and fast beliefs that there's something I have to defend myself against. Through the mist comes the idea that I, the child of God, am ever perfect, needing no defense. We release ourselves from the conflict and discover there never was a conflict except in our sense of self which we were striving to glorify. The conflict of wills is slowly removed. If not, the trumpets are now intensified. Now the third angel will sound. Those of us who still believe that God is not all, 
that we are not spirit, that we are not the permanent spiritual image of the Father, that we are not self-sufficient in Christ, we hear the third trumpet. There fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. Now the star that falls from heaven is heaven, the spirit removing its protection from the false self-will of man. So the self-will falls to earth. It has lost the protection of heaven. We were permitted to make our errors up to a point, but now even that protection behind us when we made our errors is removed. And we begin to see that the errors are not punishment whatsoever. They are simply ignorance of the truth about God. We are face to face with the fact that we, in our ignorance, in our violation, are merely charged for that violation. The sea receives the self-will of man. And it is called wormwood because the waters will turn bitter. The bitterness is our own bitterness with our own actions. We see that everything we do does not prosper. And whereas we were so anxious to do this and that as we saw it, hardly waiting for the Father's confirmation, we now see that our own actions turn to bitterness within us. We lived our lives as if we had been shot out of a cannon. And all of a sudden we find that our forward action is impeded. The great things we thought we were going to do have turned sour. We are beginning to distrust ourselves. Our own human will. third part of the waters become wormwood and many died of the waters because they were made bitter whenever you hear about dying it's always about men's actions men's deeds men's concepts all of this is a description of the warfare in one individual's being between mortal mind and soul and all of the symbolism is the death of mortal mind as soul penetrates with truth. This is not about the outer world. This is our inner conflict between mind and spirit. There's hardly anyone who hasn't recognized that most of their lives have been spent in that conflict. Walking against the unknown will of the Father while we walk in our own particular desires. Now we have learned that our own desires lead to a bitterness as the star of self-will falls into the sea. The fourth angel sounded. Third part of the sun was smitten. Third part of the moon. Third part of the stars. So as the third part of them were darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. All of the great cherished truths that we had believed in are smashed. 
man of his own self can do nothing. Individually, we discover this, and collectively it outpictures. It outpictures as confusion. It outpictures as man becoming entangled. It outpictures as the world we live in today. The individual confusion through the inability to walk in the will of the Father becomes national confusion. Governments become confused. Heads of governments, people everywhere. And you find laws being passed which are makeshift, without depth, without real thought behind them, just to take care of changing emergencies. <coughs> laws that cannot fit the permanent sense of statesmanship or fill the divine will. And as man becomes more entangled and more confused, his efforts continue always in his own self-will, self-knowledge, until he discovers that his own knowledge is inadequate. He cannot extricate himself from the confusion which his own will has brought him to. And thus spirit, removing its protection from the self-will of man, permits man in his self-will to see the nature of his own inadequacy. All the difficulties that beset us in the world today are the result of man's unawareness of divine will, his walking in his own will, and his now discovery that the fruits of his own will are what he is suffering from. This is this fourth sounding of the trumpet. Perhaps the world hasn't reached that stage yet, but it may be very close when man discovers that his polluted oceans, his polluted lakes, his polluted air is nothing but his material consciousness made visible. As spirit infiltrates the consciousness of man, it then becomes known to man that there is only one way out of his confusion, and that is to find the will of the Father to cease his unawareness of it which constitutes disobedience to that will. To yield. But there is more to it, more than just yielding. There is another trumpet. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. And so at this stage in our journey, man is still to receive a new impulse from within. You might say that the fourth trumpet and the confusions that resulted from that spiritual impulse has opened man to the beginning of an understanding of the hypnosis which envelops the earth that all of the evils and problems that beset the human race constitute not God's will upon the earth but man's disobedience to God's will man's baking the cake for 30 minutes when he was told to bake it for 20 but now is revealed why man is disobedient to God's will 
even when man wishes to be obedient. There is a growing awareness of the nature of that disobedience. That there is a force at work compelling man to be disobedient. And in these four trumpets, the spirit is awakening man to the cause of his unrest. He is learning that even though he reads the Bible, even though he goes to church, even though he prays, even though he says, I believe in God, his disobedience to God continues because there is in him a force at work which he has not recognized. A force which is a liar from the start, a murderer from the beginning. There is in him something that kills, that hates, that is violent, that is untrue, that disobeys reality. And his unawareness of that force has been the cause of his problems. Now that force is being revealed. Suddenly the protection of spirit is removed completely and the force which causes mortality, which causes death, which causes the evils of the world, the tortures of the mind and the body, that force is revealed as the world mind, the false world mind, the counterfeit mind. And we see that Satan, the counterfeit mind, is the human mind. Man wouldn't believe that without the trumpet sounding within him. Until one day he opens his eyes and says, My God, Satan is my mind. The serpent in my midst, which causes all of my problems, is the mortal mind in me which looks out and says, God isn't there. Look at all that evil. Look at all those terrible things. The fifth angel sounded, this is the beginning of chapter 9. And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. To him was given the key of the bottomless pit. This is very important for us. This fifth star falling, I mean the star falling with a fifth trumpet sound. First the star fell from heaven which was each individual self will. And then ultimately the star falls is the whole will of the earth. As each individual loses self-will, the earth loses self-will, and divine will becomes more recognized. Now the key to the bottomless pit is called this star because as man loses self-will, It's like taking off a disguise. He recognizes the will that has been moving him was not his own will. He has been moved by a will other than his own under the belief that it was his will. And it wasn't divine will that was moving him either. He sees the nature of his false will as his false ambitions. It's as if a hypnotist within himself was saying, do this, do that. And slavishly he went forth and did this and did that, thinking it was his own will. At this point we learn we really were under a state of hypnosis. 
moved by a will not of the Father, but not our own, while thinking it was our own will. When Paul told us, Tavi, that mind that was in Christ Jesus, he was telling us about the false will that moves through the mind of man. When Jesus told us, Be ye reborn of the water and the Spirit, he too was telling us about the false will that moves through the mind of man. When he was telling us to lay down our life and pick it up again, he was telling us that the will which moves through each individual human mind is the tempter, a deceiver from the first. And now this key to the bottomless pit is the revelation to each individual that the bottomless pit is the world mind. No matter what he does while in a human sense of mind, he's in a bottomless pit. There's no end to the ways he can be fooled. Now man begins to have misgivings about his work on earth. He thought he was a great success, or he thought he was a great failure, but he was neither. He cannot be a failure, and he cannot be a success. He must learn that I of mine own self can do nothing. Man's idea of success is not God's idea of success. God's idea of success is live in your eternal life. God's idea of success is a new earth and a new heaven. That is not our idea of material success. God's idea of success is the continual expression of newness. of health that can never be impaired by anything on this earth, of beauty without ugliness, of joy without sorrow. God's idea of success is not vulnerability to the things of this world. God's idea of success is not success in the world, but success in the kingdom of God. If we were limited to our own ideas of success, we would never hear the will of the Father saying, Come into my kingdom, be ye reborn of the Spirit. I in the midst of the am the resurrection. Do these sounds like sound like the words to tell us how to be successful in a material world? And so self-will finally discovers its concept of success was fine up to a point. And then it turns out to be the delusion of a lifetime. It isn't the success of spiritual realization. It isn't the success of the birth of the Christ in you. It's the success that cannot walk through the valley of the shadow of death, fearing no evil. But now, with the new inner impulse, with the opening of a realization of your spiritual selfhood, comes the desire to seek not my way, not my will. And we are lifted into the great rhythm of the spiritual universe. We have unmasked the tempter in our midst. The false sense of self which says, I of mine own self can do many things.
Now, you must learn to recognize this false sense of self, or else for you, the fifth trumpet has not done its work. This false sense of self should make you look at your own works now, as is described in the Revelation, for this is how John now sees men as they are opened up, as they learn to look out at the works of their own human efforts. He opened the bottomless pit, there arose a smoke out of the pit. You see, out of mortal mind come the works, the smoke of mortal mind. As the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Sounds like Los Angeles smog. But all over the earth, the work of mortal mind becomes a mist, so that we do not see the real sun and the real sky. We see our concept. We do not see the living Christ. We look through the glass darkly of our mortal mind. Now this mortal mind is not just an abstraction. It's not something out there. Mortal mind is being revealed as the force in a person that looks out from within through that person's eyes into the world. It is the world mind individualized in each living child. Each child grows up with that mortal mind until something happens until it learns and can stand on a new identity and say, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Until it can stand on the realization that spirit cannot be born or die. That spirit can only do the will of the Father. That spirit does not live in mortal works, in the bottomless pit. That spirit is eternally free, not held in prison to the mind. There came out of the smoke, this means out of the works of mortal mind, locusts upon the earth. Unto them was given power as scorpions of the earth have power. And now we are seeing what has eaten up all of our efforts through all of our mortal days. The locusts are those works which to us seem so marvelous, rewarding, and yet, in spite of how marvelously rewarding they appeared, they ate up the fruits of our endeavor. They were great works to us, but now they appear as locusts. We see them in their true light. We begin to see that the works of man are not the works of God. The works of man turn into works of violence, into works of hate, into works of loss, into wor works of death, into works of unrest, into works of war. We see whole nations at the mercy of the works of man. We see all of youth being moved out to the roll of drums. Why? Because man says, we need a rice paddy in Vietnam. Oh, there's something over here that we must get. To him it sounds wonderful. He needs these things. And he'll pay the price of human life for it. And now all this 
is being revealed as locusts, false concepts that destroy. The lost years of the locusts are mortal mind living itself through each individual, leading us into false ambitions that destroy themselves and end in nothing. These locusts to us appear to be great things until something in us is awakened to the reality of them and we see them as a nothingness posing as a somethingness. We are being open to the lost years of the locusts and the key to the bottomless pit is the recognition of mortal mind for what it is. The minute you are no longer under the belief that you're looking at snakes when there are none, you're out of the hypnosis. The recognition that the snakes are not there is the awakening from the hypnosis that there was snakes, that there were snakes where there weren't any. The recognition of their nothingness, of their not being present, is your awakening from the sleep. The recognition of the deeds of material consciousness as being a nothingness, a perishable, without substance, without divine law, without divine consent, without divine purpose. In this recognition that the bottomless pit is the material universe, It is just like coming into the realization that there are no snakes in your living room. You are awakening from the falseness which up to that point was a reality. And so the angel, the fifth angel who sounds, awakens us to the reality that there is no need for war there is no competition in spirit. There is no lack in one place and an abundance in another in spirit. We have been operating under man-made laws, not divine laws. And the price we pay are the newspaper headlines. The problems that each family and each country face because we have been so convinced that we all knew the way. It was good enough just to touch the Bible occasionally and say, well, I believe in God, now I go out and do what I think is best. And with the fifth trumpet we discover that I didn't go out and do what I thought was best. I went out and did what mortal mind thought was best. It wasn't me doing anything. It was mortal mind doing. It wasn't my decision. It was mortal mind's decision. It wasn't my action. It was mortal mind's action. It wasn't even my body. It was mortal mind's body. We are seeing the image universe of mortal mind. We are seeing why there is anarchy in the material universe. We are seeing why there are opposites, why there are great gaps, why there is pain. It isn't there. It isn't there at all. Only God is there. Only the spiritual universe is there. Only the allness of God is. But we were confused by the serpent in our midst who looked out and said oh no no not only God look what's out there there's a great opportunity for you you can be somebody and you better start storing things in barns because tomorrow there's going to be a great deficit on the earth a great lack a great famine you better get your food in while you can and what about stocks and bonds you better watch out they're going to hurt you.
we accepted that there is another world beside God's perfect universe. And to us, it was real. And our great ambitions, they were great things. We were doing the works of God. We convinced ourselves. We know better. We have not been doing the works of God. Only Christ can do the works of God. No mortal being can do the works of the immortal self. The flesh profiteth nothing and it's time to know it. Fifth trumpet. There came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. Unto them was given power and the scorpions of the earth as the scorpions of the earth have power. You see, the power of protection of God has been removed. And now our own works can sting us. Finally, we can see that we are stung by our own self-activity. It was commanded to them that they should hurt the grass of the earth, not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. That means those who have been sealed with spiritual awareness. But only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads, those who are not seeking to live totally in the will of the Father. Those who are still lingering in the consciousness that matter is real, unaware that matter is mortal mind appearing as material forms. The unillumined must still receive the sting of their own work. To them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they, t- that they should be tormented five months. And this five months then means that they would go through five different degrees of consciousness until the sixth trumpet would sound. They had to be lifted to a place where they could receive spiritual impulse. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Living in matter, they had to live in the laws of matter. And matter being our belief that God is not all, the moment we are in a material consciousness, we are saying God is not all. Because God is not matter. And our consciousness of matter is the statement that God is not all. If you have any doubt about God not being matter, Remember that any material being can be shot any day of his life and you're not going to shoot God. And it doesn't matter how good that material being has been. There was a judge over here in San Rafael. He was one of those living saints to his friends. He's not around today. Over the weekend something happened. It doesn't matter how good we've been or how bad we've been. You couldn't have been worse than Saul. But he was blinded. And that blinding might have been a curse to others, but it wasn't. It was a blessing. Because he was blinded to his material consciousness. And out of it was born his Christ awareness. Our blinding need not be that violent. It can be the gentle realization that God being all and God being spirit, spirit is all. And therefore I will seek first the kingdom of spirit. And all things must therefore be added because having the substance of spirit I must have the forms. Now man doubts himself. His spiritual consciousness begins to make him see his own works as locusts. And of these days shall men seek death. Shall not find it. And they shall desire it. 
They shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. You remember Job? I wished he could die. Fortunately, he didn't. He learned the truth of God instead and found that there is no death in God. We merely die to that which is not true, to that which is unreal, that the real may show forth. The shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. Men going out to conquer the world. Now they begin to see that when they were doing that, they weren't conquering the world. Those horses prepared for battle were only locusts that were going to devour the rider. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, victory. Their faces were the faces of men, as the faces of men. And this is man's conceit. As he rides out on his horse, that's how his deeds look to him, things riding to victory. He feels that he's doing God's work. He's the great image and likeness of the Father. But he's not. They had as their hair, hair of women. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Now we're describing the deeds of men in material consciousness. They're beginning to see that they were lured by the false beauty of their own deeds. Hair like women. They were admiring their great deeds. And their deeds had teeth like lions. They were tied, chained to their deeds. Which they considered deeds of great vision and courage. Their deeds had teeth like lion, lions to chain them to these deeds. This describes the way we have all felt about our human accomplishments. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. And these breastplates are the desire of the human for power, for advantage. Our deeds gave us power and advantage. They lifted us above the mass. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots and of many horses running to battles. And the wings are the great works we thought we were doing. You've seen those little birds as they just stand in the middle of nowhere, the wings just are going a mile a minute. That's how our wings appear to us. We're moving so fast, but we're getting nowhere in the material consciousness. And they had tails like unto scorpions. There were stings in their tails and there were power there to hurt men five months. These are the deeds then which look to us so great, which turn out to be locusts in disguise, consuming our time and our effort and our human lives. This isn't the way of the Father. Put off the garment of mortality. Walk in the Spirit. You'll discover all of the things you have striven to accumulate, you already had. There was nothing missing. You had the fullness of God. You've had it from the first, you shall have it unto everlasting. I will never leave thee. Everything that we spend a human lifetime to get is but a paltry pittance compared to the allness that is already in our substance as the child of God. That great secret is revealed to you as the voice of the Spirit, as the power of the Spirit, as the action of the Spirit touches your consciousness. All that I have been seeking, I am. 
How could I be the child of God and be less than a perfect child? Could the child of God have lacked anything? What was all my striving and seeking but the belief that I was not the child of God? And so not being the child of God in my consciousness, I went out to secure those things which the child of God already was born with, already has. I merely denied my inheritance. I denied my identity. I and three billion others. The child of God has all that the Father has. Who is this human seeking? Who is this human striving? Who is this human who is protecting himself? He who is unaware that he is the child of God. That is each of us in our human consciousness. And now our works appear to us as locusts. We see we have striven to obtain that which we already possess. What greater waste could there be? The mortal mind in us has consumed us. We are being lifted out of it. <coughs> and these locusts had over them a king which is the angel of the bottomless pit whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon but in the Greek hath his name Apollyon I don't know what it means in the Hebrew but Apollyon means destroyer in Greek and so the head of these locusts these false works of man is called destroyer again we are being told mortal mind makes us think we're going to victory while it destroys that which it builds why does it destroy? Because it is building an imitation universe of images called material self. God is all. The revelation of St. John is no different than the revelation of Jesus directly to the world. God is all. And because man cannot accept that, there is more scripture to be revealed and there is more scripture to be revealed in the living Bible of your own soul. Ever will that soul reveal to you the nature of the allness of spirit until the day when the false human consciousness steps aside and the soul establishes the kingdom of heaven on earth where you stand. Revealed, realized, understood and lived in as your immortal self. You find then you have no personal ambition. There's nothing you have to go out to accomplish, but rather you will live in a different way. In a way that it is being recommended very forcibly now by the trumpets that you learn to live here and now. And with the sixth trumpet we are seen that way. One woe is past. Behold, there come two more woes hereafter. The sixth trumpet, the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Now loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Remember those four angels at the ends of the earth? They were bound in the great river Euphrates. That means that we were blind to their presence. We were not awake to them. We were sleeping in the great river Euphrates. Sense perception, the sea of the five senses is that river Euphrates because down it comes the cargo 
of mortal mind which we all buy and worship. The false cargo of mortal mind comes down the senses. And the senses say, oh, isn't that a beautiful thing there? Isn't that a wonderful thing there? And if I could just get my hand on some of that over there. The five senses of the river Euphrates. And they bind us to the four angels. Let's call these four angels... four levels of our divine will in which we are first willing and then submissive and then receptive to that will and finally the fourth because we are willing submissive receptive we are able to walk forth and to do the divine will to live in the action of the divine will and now these four angels are revealed then as the willingness in us, submissiveness, receptivity, and the action of the will of the Father. They were told to withhold their action until we had been sealed. And now that man knows the nature of mortal mind is to deceive and that matter is the imitation mortal mind casts forth of the perfect spirit. The impulse to be willing, submissive, receptive, and to live in the action of spirit is felt in the soul of man, dissolving the false sense of consciousness. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. The slaying is always the laying aside of another degree of mortal mind. Slaying the false mortal mind beliefs. You see, you're moving toward the realization of Christ's mind. Dying to the false, being born of the new. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000, thousand, and I heard the number of them. These horsemen, these numberless horsemen, are those who have come out of the consciousness of body. They're absent from the body. They're living in the will of the Father. They walk the earth both visible and invisible. Some have made transition, some are not. Some are still visible in the flesh. We are to be among these horsemen if we are not already. And always, these numberless horsemen are the influences behind the veil ever working to liberate us, to penetrate our consciousness as we open always surrounding us, ever-present. Now the allness of God is more of an immediate fact that we are ready to accept at this level. For we are in the sixth trumpet. And I saw the horses in the vision and they sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone. Now we see the breastplates represent the power of spirit coming through consciousness. And the power of spirit lies in the jacinth, the brimstone, the fire. The fire would be the the truth the jacinth the will I don't really feel I have this particular place clear
brimstone, the justice. We are being introduced to the righteousness of the spirit which transcends the human sense of righteousness and these symbols are telling us then that there is a new authority being born in us an authority which is superseding the mortal mind which had been our authority we are becoming aware then of a new light we have identified mortal mind in ourself and because of this identification we are able to recognize the truth wherein the lie of mortal mind we had been blind to the truth Whereas before we worshipped God in name only, now we are receiving the living Spirit of God. We're in a state of change of consciousness. The heads of these horses are as the heads of lions. That's the authority of Spirit in us the authority of the Lion of Judah, the authority of the Christ. We can now recognize that inner impulse which takes us out of world mind. We are receptive to the Christ. We know our shepherd's voice. We are in a state of one will, living in the one will of the Father now, independent of the false, the imitative will of mortal mind. You have reached the place where you can be capable of receiving the will through Christ in you. Now that divine state of being is while in your mortal appearance of selfhood. That is Christ in you realized, fed from above, not on the bread of the world, but fed on the bread that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Father. This is a condition of being which is the destiny of every individual on the earth. And it should be, for all of us, a level at which we are now feeling comfortable, able to relax, able to recognize the tempter in our midst as mortal mind, able to know that out there the images presented in form are not divine creation and therefore are not sustained by divinity, able to know further that every material form that we see represents the lie about the divine image and likeness that stands there. This is the change in consciousness in you which permits you to stand ye still. Now there's a very important realization at this place that should take place. That everything out there visibly was not placed there by God. It only takes normal intelligence to realize that. You don't have a bomb burst into God's garden. 
You don't have flowers devastated by the wheels of a truck. You don't have people in panic. If they were all placed out there by God, you're looking at concept, human concept, mortal mind concept. But it isn't out there if only God is out there. And this is how we learn that because God is all and God is not that material appearance out there, it isn't there. It can't be there. Something else must be there. And that spiritual something else that is there isn't going to go away. It's always going to be there. The invisible Christ is not going to go away. Now what is out there that appears to us has not been placed there by God? Who has placed it there? Mortal mind, fine, but why do you see it? Why do you tangle with it? Why do you label it good or bad? Because mortal mind in you is doing it. Now at this place, for each of us who is striving to come to a place where we are dominant and not dominated, Learn this, please. There's nothing out there that you have to change. This little fellow in you that is looking out there and proclaiming that good or bad, this little fellow is a liar. Mortal mind in you which says that out there is good and that out there is bad, that mortal mind in you is the liar. You have only one person in the universe to overcome. Not the armies out there, not the floods out there, not the fires out there, not the lacks and the limitations out there. They aren't there. God is there. You have that self, that serpent in the midst, which says God is not there. These other things are there. This is the fellow to overcome. The serpent in the midst. Nothing else. And if you only spend two weeks working on that serpent in the midst, Instead of the world outside, you discover the reality of that state. And that's the importance of the sixth trumpet. It isolates for us the cause of the world problems as not external to ourselves, but rather as the invisible serpent which Moses raised up in the wilderness. That false consciousness in us which looks out at the kingdom of God on earth and pronounces it this world of war, of hate, of violence, of good and bad. It isn't there that way at all. And so we're coming to the place where we're willing to accept the allness of God, meaning this is the Garden of Eden here now. We are the children of God here now. And the tempter in our midst is saying, no, you're not. That tempter is the invisible consciousness of each mortal being. It's the fellow who woke you up this morning, unless you woke up in the spirit. Now, it's that mortal consciousness which pronounces a world of good and evil, or it's the Christ in you, which pronounces you're now walking in the Garden of Eden, the place where on thou standest is holy ground. There is no external evil in the universe, not in Christ consciousness. And any consciousness that is not Christ consciousness is a false consciousness, because Christ is the child of God. If we were to stop and say, well, I understand that, we would not have it. It is necessary to be willing, submissive, receptive, and then to proceed into the action, the deeds that bespeak the consciousness of Christ. And so we must learn to take dominion not over the world, 
but over the mind of the world that inhabits your body. When you take dominion over the mind of the world in you, you discover you have dominion over the world. That dominion is a beautiful dominion. It does not enable you to go out and do your will. It merely makes you an instrument for the perfect will. And you can measure your fidelity by the degree of harmony that shows forth through your living in that will. Now I repeat, you must practice taking dominion over the mind in you, not over the world. Whenever your mind identifies an evil on the earth, that is not the mind of God in you. That is mortal mind posing as your mind, and it is not your mind either. Your mind is not identifying evil. That is the mind you have falsely accepted as your mind. And that is the serpent in our midst. The mind that accepts the reality of matter is the mind that is not your mind but has been posing as your mind in your mortal life. This is the nature of hypnosis. Each of us has an opportunity through the receptivity to the Christ within which has already overcome the world mind to be lifted above, to transcend that false state of mind which is no mind at all. And that shows the serpent to be nothing but a brass serpent, immobile, helpless, unable to speak. I think it's more or less going home time, so we're going to conclude with this we still have the seventh trumpet and the conclusion of this sixth trumpet would you consider doing this please there is an experience which is the discovery of mortal mind in you There is a something in you, for example, that knows that in two hours you're going to be home or sitting in, a, in one of your favorite restaurants. That something in you is mortal mind. There is a something in you that knows that tomorrow is Monday and a certain pattern of events must be taken care of tomorrow. That is mortal mind. There is something in you that makes decisions. And if you're still in a mortal consciousness, that is mortal mind. Now that mortal mind does not consult God. That mortal mind does its own will in you. And you go out and you think you're doing your will. You're doing the will of that mortal mind. Perhaps at this moment, that sounds like a statement you can't quite see. But awake thou that sleepest is going to mean your ability to look at the thought process of your mind and the will of your own mind and to recognize that you have been under the influence of a mind that is not your own. A mind that awakened this morning a mind that decided what you should wear. A mind that can tell you to move your right hand out here and your left hand out there. A mind that can tell you to run across the room, down the hill, up the hill. A mind that can say, get into the car, get out of the car. That is mortal mind. A mind that can tell you all the things that you should do. And it is not the mind of God. That mind in each individual on this earth is mortal mind. There comes a moment when you stand back and you look at it and say, well, you're the same fellow who told me last week I was sick. 
You're the fellow who told me Uncle Harry died. You're the fellow who told me that my neighbor's son was taking acid and that we shouldn't talk to him anymore. You're the one who told me this. You're the one who told me God is an awe. When you went to the hospital to see Uncle Harry, you were looking at mortal mind, not Uncle Harry. When you look at any sin, disease, or death in this universe, you're looking at mortal mind made visible. When you look at decay, you're looking at mortal mind made visible. When you look at what you call old age, you're looking at mortal mind made visible. Whose mind is it? The mind of God? No, it's the tempter on earth. It's the imitation mind which is the mind of the mortal, the human mind. I don't know who said it, but a human was called by him a you of a man, just a shadow of a man, a you man. When you are able to look at this mortal mind in you, you have seen the tempter. You've seen all that the Bible is talking about when they say, Satan, get thee behind me. And yet, that mortal mind saw you through the day. You will learn that that not being the Christ mind, it is the anti-Christ mind. It is the tempter in our midst. And the height of wisdom is to learn to look at this mind until you can look at it without taking its thought. Take no thought from that mind in you which is not the Christ mind. Many will heed this, many will not. It has been written 20 centuries. And there are some of us who are still just learning it and still doubting it and still willing to give our works to the locusts. Now that's where we leave today, with the knowledge that there is a living organism in us called mortal mind which has pretended to be my mind, which has identified a false universe and which I in my innocence have accepted. It has even identified a false body, for the only body is the body of the soul, the spirit. Each of us has this soul body which mortal mind is incapable of recognizing. And as you recognize mortal mind, you have the key to the bottomless pit. The recognition of mortal mind as an imposter removes it of its power. And then every idea it advances, every belief it advances, every identification it advances, you can look at and say, sorry. That was in my old consciousness. I have returned to the Father's house. The only mind I recognize is Christ's mind. And it, the immortal mind, can live now here in the immortal universe on earth. So we're grateful for our trumpets and the sound, the intensity of their work within us, for they finally are going to awaken us who sleep. And Christ will give us light. Have a happy journey and hope to see you next week.